Great. So thanks for the introduction, Armand. Um, so as Armand mentioned, I'm um, in the Awadal lab at the uh, Department of Molecular Genetics at University of Toronto. And today I'm just going to be giving you an overview of some of the work I've been doing looking at characterizing healthy aging in blood and using population cohorts to do that. Oops. So age is a primary risk factor for chronic disease. And here I'm just showing you a few examples of that where I've plotted the incidence rates for four different diseases across age, different age groups. And so we see that as the incidence rates increase, the age does as well. And so over an individual's lifetime, they accumulate different types of damage, which I've listed here. And in response to these different types of damage, cells try to alter these different cellular responses. However, if these responses become chronic, then cells may exhibit an aging phenotype. And collectively, these are known as the nine hallmarks of aging. And although there is generally a physiological decline with age, some individuals remain healthy over their lifetime. And these are the individuals that I'm really interested in studying because if we can understand what keeps them healthy, then we can try to prevent age-related diseases altogether rather than treating each one individually. So although we have these nine hallmarks of aging, um, it can be very difficult to define aging at the level of an organism because these processes can occur at different rates in different tissues and different cells. So I'm focusing on blood. So blood is a dynamic tissue and it's composed of um, many different uh, cell populations here at the bottom. And they're all, um, they all arise from the differentiation of hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and they have diverse roles in uh, oxygen transport as well as immunity. And with increased age, we generally see a bias towards the myeloid lineages um, here on the left. And there's also a general functional decline across many of these differentiated cell populations. We also often measure phenotypes of these different uh, blood cell types, uh, some of which I've listed below. And if you've ever looked at your own blood test, you might recognize some of them as well. And the reason why we measure these blood cell traits is because they're associated with many different diseases. So given what we know about the importance of the hematopoietic system and the differentiated blood cells that it contains, as well as the effects that aging has on it, what I'm interested in understanding is the factors that can actually contribute to the healthy aging of blood. And so to answer this question, um, I'm looking at both genetic factors as well as um, using functional genomics to understand the molecular mechanisms behind these factors. And I'm doing all of this using data from large population cohorts. So for today, I'm going to be talking um, about the functional genomics aspect. So the population cohort that I use is called CAMPATH. So this is Canada's population cohort with about 320,000 individuals between the ages of 30 to 79. And all of these individuals have detailed questionnaire data. And for a subset of them, we have physical measures, which include things like blood pressure. And we also have some biologics, uh, including blood that has complete blood count data associated with it as well. So to actually understand what contributes to healthy aging of blood, we need to actually define what that phenotype is. So we do that using a complete blood count risk score as a measure of blood health. So the risk score that we use is a modified version of a previously developed risk score. And the way that this score was developed was by taking CBC data from 25,000 individuals, following those individuals up for five years via electronic health records, and then doing risk modeling with those CBC variables to determine which of those variables are most predictive of mortality risk. And the way that we interpret this information is um, by saying if you have a decreased risk of mortality based off of those CBC variables, then you have healthier blood. Um, so one of the main things to remember is that a lower CBC risk score is considered healthy for the rest of my talk. So if we look at the CBC risk score across the CAMPATH participants, um, so here I've just plotted the CBC risk score on the x-axis and the y-axis is the proportion of participants um, in each score bin and it's colored by age group. So those individuals that I'm most interested in studying are the 
oldest individuals in the cohort with the lowest CBC risk scores. So we refer to these as old healthy individuals. And we have um, one hypothesis that there might be some sort of protective mechanism that's keeping their blood healthy. So meaning that their blood is simply different from the blood of individuals um, who we consider unhealthy. But to test this hypothesis, we need to compare these individuals to those old individuals with unhealthy blood. A second hypothesis we have is that there might be some sort of healthy aging mechanism meaning that blood from old healthy individuals is the same as blood from young healthy individuals. And if the second hypothesis is true, we think that there might also be some sort of accelerated aging mechanism, meaning that blood from young unhealthy individuals is the same as old unhealthy. Um, so we took, we selected individuals from those four groups in the CAMPATH cohort. Um, and in addition to those selection criteria, we also um, ensured that the individuals had no self-reported disease. Um, so we obtained those blood samples and then performed um, single cell RNA sequencing on about 400 samples. And essentially the output that we get from the single cell RNA sequencing is a gene by cell matrix. Um, and so all in all, we sequenced 398 libraries um, and about 500,000 single cells. And all of the sample processing was done um, by Elias and the lab. Um, so in case um, anyone isn't familiar with the analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data, I just want to go through that pipeline very briefly. Um, so typically what is done is that um, first you'll start off with some sort of quality control to remove any low quality cells and then uh, normalization of the count data. And then uh, a feature selection, which will hopefully identify genes that are markers for the cell states that you expect to find in your sample. And then using those features, a dimension, dimensionality reduction is performed, and then a cell-to-cell -cell distance or similarity metric can be measured. And from that metric, you can perform uh, some clustering to identify distinct cell states. So when we do this type of analysis on one of our samples, here I'm just showing you an example. Um, and here we're just looking at a UMAP plot, uh, which is just a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, and this sample has about 2,000 cells in it, and we identify 10 different cell states. But when we do the same process on a sample with 500 cells, we only identify four cell states because we have much fewer cells. So this brings up um, the question of how we can compare cell states that are unique to one sample. So to overcome this, we've uh, created a reference data set and so this reference data set is comprised of 51 samples that are spread across our four different risk groups that we're interested in. And there's about 100,000 cells in here. And so this re uh, reference data set has a few advantages. So the first is that we can identify rare cell types. So in this uh, data set, we identify 22 different cell states. Um, and I've just labeled what those cell types are. And now we can actually compare the same cell type between our four different groups because they're all represented in this one data set. And we can also use this data set to map new samples too. So the way that we do that is using a method that's implemented in Surat, which is an R package for single cell RNA-seq data analysis. And so the way this method works is by taking a reference data set, such as the one I just showed you, and a query data set, which would be something that comes off the sequencer, and then um, those two data sets are reduced into the same uh, dimensional space. And then anchors are identified between the reference and query data set. So anchors are sets of cells that are transcriptionally similar. And then those anchors are scored. Uh, so the way that they're scored is by looking at the overlapping neighborhoods between um, the two anchor pairs. So for example, um, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, on the bottom left, if you have this green cell in the query data set and it's shown to be transcriptionally similar to this purple cell in the reference data set, if we look at another cell in that same uh, cluster from the reference data set and we look at uh, which cells it's most transcriptionally similar to in the query, we should hope hopefully find that same uh, cell in the query data set, uh, which is shown on the left hand example. Um, but low scoring anchors, for example, here, um, if we look at 
um, this query cell, its transcription is similar to one cell in the reference data set, but the neighbor of that cell is actually more similar to a cell in a completely different cluster. So we applied this method to our remaining 470,000 cells. And here I'm just showing you the prediction scores that we get. And so on average, um, we're getting very high prediction scores, which is promising. And if we look at these prediction scores across different cell types, um, we see, for example, monocytes, which are the first three box plots in green. Monocytes have um, highly expressed canonical gene markers uh, that are very specific to these cell populations. So on average, we get prediction scores of one. However, if you look at the orange box plots, these are CD4 positive T cells, and there's many different subtypes of these cells. So we get these much wider uh, distributions of prediction scores, and that's likely because these different cell types are being predicted as each other. Um, so overall, we're getting very large prediction scores. Um, so the red dashed line here is just showing you uh, 0.7, and on average, most of our clusters uh, are above that line. So now that we've labeled all of our cell types, we perform uh, some differential gene expression. And this is done pairwise between our four different groups of individuals that we're interested in. And we do this for each cell state that we've identified. So the first example I'm gonna show you is from a cluster of B cells. Um, and we identify a potentially protective mechanism. Um, so just to recall, the protective mechanism means that old healthy blood is different from old and healthy blood. So that can mean that we have expression of a gene that's higher in our old healthy individuals and lower in the old unhealthy individuals or vice versa. Um, so here I'm just showing you a volcano plot from the results of that differential gene expression analysis. So the log full change is plotted on the x axis and the minus log 10 p value on the y and each point is a different gene. Um, so I've just highlighted um, some interesting genes um, that you can ask me about later if you want. Um, but if we then take, for example, all of these upregulated genes in our um, old unhealthy individuals and we perform pathway analysis, um, what the top pathway that comes up is the interferon gamma mediated signaling pathway. Um, so this is suggesting that we're seeing more inflammation in our old unhealthy individuals relative to the old healthy individuals. Um, and one of the genes in this pathway, beta-2 microglobulin, um, uh, here on the bottom left, I'm showing you the expression of this gene, and we see that it is um, elevated in our old unhealthy individuals relative to the other groups. And this is actually a gene that's considered a, a pro-aging factor and is associated with neurological decline. So that was one kind of um, really interesting result that we found. Um, and then I just want to quickly go through one more example um, for our second hypothesis, which is looking at a healthy aging mechanism, meaning that old healthy blood is the same as young healthy blood. And this is a differential gene expression analysis uh, between NK cells or natural killer cells. Um, so for this hypothesis, what we're looking for is that we still expect a difference between the old unhealthy individuals and the old healthy individuals, but we expect no difference between our old healthy and young healthy and it could be uh, the opposite as well. And so just to highlight, um, again, another really interesting gene, um, TSC22D3. So uh, it has relatively low expression um, across all groups in uh, this population of NK cells. Um, but what's really interesting is that we see um, higher expression in both of our unhealthy groups, young and old. Um, and the really interesting part about this gene is that increased expression of this gene is associated with increased blood pressure. Um, and for anyone who is familiar with age-related clonal hematopoiesis, um, which has become kind of a hot topic in the last uh, few years, this gene is actually found to be um, increased in individuals who have a germline mutation uh, for loss of heterozygosity in TET2, which is one of those commonly mutated ARCH genes. Um, so hopefully I'm not too much over time, but this is just to give you um, an example of how we're using this data and looking for these types of patterns to try and identify um, what's contributing to healthy aging in blood. Um, and so in the future, um, we've actually done attack sequencing on the same individuals. So we'll be looking to integrate that data to look at um, what may be regulating these changes in gene expression, as well as looking at both germline and somatic variation 
and using those um, variants to do EQTL mapping. Uh, and so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, my lab, especially um, the individuals who are highlighted here who have contributed to this work, um, as well as funding sources. And if there's time, I'll take questions. Thank you.